Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar, The Future of Biometrics. This is Peter O'Neill from Find Biometrics, and I am pleased to let you know that there are over 200 of your industry colleagues joining you in this webinar event today. Before I start, I would like to thank our last webinar moderator, John Mears from Lockheed Martin, for his excellent work on the topic interoperability at the intersection of policy and public perception. Thanks also to our last panelists for that webinar, Jim Loudermilk from the FBI, Mark Branchflower from Interpol, and Alan Hansen from Novaris. There are two presentations you will be hearing today, fresh from rave reviews at the NDIA conference held last month in Washington. At the end of the presentations, we will be answering your questions. And uh, to ask a question, just simply type it into your dialog box in the Go To Control Panel on the right-hand side. And before I start, I would like to do a quick poll to see uh, what you will see on your screen. And I will just launch that now for you. In five years' time, what percent of the global population will be biometrically enrolled in some type of program? Please indicate your choice, and I'll keep this poll open for about 30 seconds. And we will share this information f with you at the end of the session. So take a second and just provide your answers. And I'm going to close the poll now. Thank you for that. And now on to the first presentation titled Back to the Future. Who controls the past controls the future and who controls the present controls the past. This is a wonderful quote from George Orwell and one that I thought would be interesting to try and apply to our discussions today by examining what the biometric industry has been doing for the past eight years up to the present day one can hopefully predict where the industry will be in the future so back to the future remember this movie with Michael J Fox 1985 this was released and I approach this topic not from a scientific or engineering point of view where one might examine the advances in the technology but rather from a marketing perspective. I am, after all, a marketer and have been exposed to hundreds of biometric companies, integrators, and academics over the past 10 years. At last count, I had interviewed over 150 CEOs and presidents of large and small biometric players from around the globe. This provides a very interesting look into the marketplace. But most importantly, at Fine Biometrics, we have amassed eight years of identical data from the top 70 global biometric leaders in the industry. Here is a snapshot of our expert panel from 2010. You will note that yes, big players are involved like Lockheed, Northrop, Crossmatch, MorphoTrack, Iris ID, and 3M. But there are also very small focus players like Sinochep in China and Speech Technology from Russia. But most importantly, I'd like you to notice that we also received input from one of the industry's most esteemed thought leaders, Maxine Most from Acuity, who you will be hearing from very shortly. The participants for the reviews also come from 24 different countries and therefore provide a true global perspective as you can see from this slide. So this is a very unique, interesting data set that I have now organized for this discussion into a snapshot of the past eight years as a hopeful predictor of what the future might look like for the biometric industry. Now let's go back, way back to 2004 and see what the issues were at that time. And the first question we asked our expert panel was, in your view, what have been the three most significant milestones or announcements for the biometric industry this year? Let's take a look at the results. 
I will be showing you yearly results for every even year starting with 2004 and then at the end I will summarize a chart for you. In 2004, industry standards and interoperability topped the list with significant advances in those areas. Also important was the growth in public awareness. Please note that I have broken out the deployments area separately so we can see how that area changes over time. In 2006, standards became slightly less important and M&A activity started to grow with L1 buying up companies in the space. New products and applications also started to grow. But look at the new deployment area start to take off from just 10% to 28% in just two years. In 2008, public awareness took over top spot with major deployments a close second. Note that standards have almost fallen off the chart and a new area, setbacks, has grown. This is due to delays in some of the large-scale government programs. M&A activity in 2008 is still very healthy. And just last year in 2010, we see a significant new look with major deployments, M&A activity, and new application growth literally taking over. The industry is maturing. One thing to note, is that the announcement of the massive UIDAI program in India accounted for the major uptick in government deployments we can see here illustrated in black. And here is the summary chart. Note as illustrated by the yellow line, the drop in standards as this area became somewhat resolved and the growth in major deployments and M&A activity due mostly last year to the recent 3M Cogent and Sajem L1 deals. The next question we asked our expert panel was, what are the most pressing, pressing issues facing the industry? Well, in 2004, again, we see that standards and interoperability dominated the discussion and although good progress was being made in 2004, as the previous question indicated, a lot of work was still required to allow the industry to move ahead. And in 2006, we almost see the identical chart. Not much of a change at all in 2006. However, in 2008, a new area takes over top spot as the major challenge that is financial climate, quite understandably, given the financial meltdown. Standards moves to last place and privacy jumps up to become a major challenge. All along, education, which is shown in blue, continues to rank as one of the top three issues facing the industry. Then, in 2010, Education and awareness moves into the top challenge facing the industry with privacy right behind as more and more large deployments move into the marketplace. The summary chart again shows significant drop in standards and interoperability as a challenge for the industry, again illustrated with that black line. And the growth of education and privacy as the top areas in need of work as more and more deployments and applications move into the market marketplace. Again, a sign of a maturing industry. Well, that provides us with a brief snapshot of the past. Now let's see what's next for the biometric industry. I had an opportunity to interview Mike Delkowski from 3M last month to, to discuss their acquisition of Cogent. And I also asked him about the future. Here is what he said. You're asking, however, about what the future holds. And what we're counting on is that over time, and this is similar to GPS technology, please remember that comment, that biometrics will migrate into many various verticals and a great many applications. There will be applications in hospitality, in financial, and I believe that you'll see an increase in applications in the building access sector as well. I am truly hoping that the technology will be able to drive itself down in costs, something similar to how GPS systems have. 
And I also found this next quote on the internet commenting about the future. The fledging industry is posed for explosive growth over the next four years, owing in large part to continuing technological advances and a growing number of potential consumer and commercial applications. Well, this sounds like a very accurate prediction of the future of the biometric industry. Wouldn't you agree? Well, yes, except this is what the experts were saying about GPS in 1995. The reason that I'm highlighting this is that not only 3M but many other experts that are familiar with both industries see tremendous similarities in terms of past growth of GPS and the future growth of the biometric industry. So where will all this growth come from? Mobile applications, financial services, healthcare, online security, physical access, automotive, national ID programs, homeland security, travel, law enforcement, especially with growth in rapid DNA advances, time and attendance, transportation, gaming, aviation, residential and hospitality, to name a few. Let's now take a look at just one area more in depth and that is mobile applications with a financial overlay. You may be aware of ISIS, which was announced last November, where AT&T, Verizon are set to target Visa and MasterCard with smartphones for payments. Mobile technology for banking and payments is reaching a tipping point with younger consumers leading the way. More than half of U.S. consumers and almost 80% of those between the ages of 18 and 34 will, will use mobile financial services within the next five years, according to Mercatus. This is definitely a game changer, said industry consultant Richard Crone uh, from California. So, what will be used to secure these devices? Well, AT&T and Verizon are not the only players interested in dominating this area. All Apple needs to do in order to turn the iPhone into a universal debit card is to add a tiny inexpensive chip to the device. And all Apple needs to do in order to make the iPhone a universal secure ID is to add a fingerprint scanner to the phone and put another chip in its various desktop systems. And on the Google side of the equation, the Android platform has also been at the forefront of workable biometric solutions for cell phones. In fact, you can already download Android apps that do face recognition and iris scanning. This is a huge market with huge potential for biometrics. And ISIS is planning to launch in 2012. Well, this is just one example of the 16 growth areas that I showed earlier, and it illustrates the explosive growth potential of the biometric industry. Just imagine layering on top of this mobile growth potential the other 15 areas that I mentioned earlier, and you will get an idea of where the industry could go in the future. Keep in mind what happened to the GPS industry. And as a final note, Keep an eye on the UIDAI project in India. This is also a significant game changer for biometrics. I'd like to thank you and to keep update on the industry, please visit our site at findbiometrics.com and also visit IBIA.org, which is the International Biometric and Identification Association. <clears throat> I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Maxine Most, who I mentioned earlier. She is the founder of Acuity Marketing Intelligence and has more than 20 years experience in international emerging technology market development. Maxine founded Acuity, a strategic research and, and analysis consultancy, to provide candid, hype-free insight exposing bottom line issues that drive and shape emerging markets. Maxine relies on rigorous intuition, a combination of quantifiable data-driven analysis and insight honed on over two decades 
to consistently provide original thought-provoking, accurate, and re reliable industry analysis. And now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Max. Take it away, Max. Thanks, Peter. Um, and I want to thank you so much for uh, sharing this opportunity to uh, communicate with everybody via the webinar. Um, Acuity and Find Biometrics have a uh, long, ongoing relationship. And, and Peter and I um, had the uh, fortunate opportunity to speak together at the NDIA conference. And it was quite interesting because we had not spoken to each other uh, about the content of our presentations. And it turned out that there was a, a, an awful lot of synergy, which um, I think um, gives you uh, some insight into you know what some of the people who are focused on this stuff day in and day out are thinking, and 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 how the the data that Peter presented, which is you know looking at the industry data over a period of time, um, is then reflected in the thoughts that I had about how the industry is moving forward. Um, when I was first asked to talk about the future of biometrics. Um, you know, I was thinking about the, the work that I've done because Huey actually has published a report called The Future of Biometrics. And, and one of the things that's really been um, uh, an interesting aspect of my um, thinking about the industry, it was, it was discussed in the report, and it's, it's been something I've talked about over several years, is the whole concept of mobility and how important it is. And so, let's see, there we go. That was my, do I have control here, Peter? I don't seem to be clicking forward. Ah, oh, there we go, today's discussion, thank you. Um, so we're gonna talk about the notion of mobility driving biometrics. Now I will put this in context. First of all, I'm not talking about what is actually happening today. I'm talking about what's gonna happen go, going forward. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that this is not the entirety of the biometrics market. There are obviously, as Peter listed, you know, so many different types of applications and places where this technology can be used. And I believe that GPS model is relevant in the sense that you're talking about an embedded technology that's going to proliferate. What is um, the focus of today's discussion really is that mobility is going to be such a critical piece of that market evolution that it's going to drive it in a lot of different ways. And initially, when I was thinking about this, you know, I always thought we'd, we'd look at sort of enterprise access control and physical access control driving biometrics in a lot of ways. Um, and that would push it out into the marketplace for more consumer type applications. What I believe now, and I've been talking about this probably since about 2006, 2007, um, given the, the evolution of the current state of mobile devices, that I believe what's going to happen is that the use of mobile biometrics is going to end up driving a lot more of the enterprise adoption because there's going to be so many mobile devices that there's going to be such a critical drive to secure those devices that we're going to end up seeing sort of a reverse um, dynamic in the market. So we'll talk about this notion that this premise of mobility of devices and the mobility of individuals is driving these de developments. And, and we're seeing this um, in the global travel identity infrastructure. We see it in the relationships uh, merging relationships and, and synergies between e-commerce and e-government as government and commercial platforms converge. And then, as I mentioned, finally, this concept that this type of mobility, actually uh, a mobile use of biometrics, if you will, 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 will drive back into enterprise adoption in both physical and logical access. And then we'll look a little bit at sort of the, the, the faces of ID mobility and the implications for the marketplace. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Acuity. Um, I would encourage you, um, if you haven't done so already, to visit our, our new website. We've re, um, sort of expanded, if you will, the focus of the company from purely biometrics to really electronic uh, identity or electronic people identification. Uh, the new website has been reorganized. It's a lot easier on the eyes, and it's a lot easier to find um, information you're looking for. Um, we have a number of research reports that we've published, uh, the future of biometrics, e-passports, and e-visas. And this year, we're, we're going to be coming out with a um, new research report on national IDs, which I think is going to be quite interesting to many of you. So 
the premise. Mobility drives biometrics. If you look at what's going to happen in the next 5 to 10 to 15 years, mobility and the associated infrastructures, platforms, and applications are really critical or key, if you will, to understanding the evolution of this marketplace. And, and mobility has a lot of meanings. It has, you know, in terms of the actual devices you're using and the fact that, that we are a, uh, a global community of people moving around. And if you look at what's happening um, in many developing nations, there's no uh, um, land-based communications infrastructure. Everything is being built out of mobile infrastructure. So it, it really is defining the way the world is evolving in many respects in terms of communication and commerce. So the global travel identity infrastructure, as I said, we, we uh, produced a report last year on um, e-passports and e-visas. And if you look at what's happening with electronic documents, um, the proliferation of these documents in a relatively short period of time has been pretty phenomenal. I mean, by 2014, our uh, forecasts show that about 87% of all visas and passports will be e-visas and e-passports. So you're talking about 60 million plus annual e-visas issued and 130 million plus annual e-passport issues. That's a huge um, electronic identity infrastructure that simply didn't exist before. And there's a lot of implications because what you're talking about is um, tens of millions of people moving around the globe and relying on electronic ID, which is linked to biometrics. You know, and that, that's something that transforms the way we think about the industry. Oops. Let's see if I can go back here. Okay. E-commerce and e-government. Um, there are 60 countries right now that have national EID platforms. Many of these are multi-application. Many of these are biometric. They're integrating um, both government services like health um, healthcare, welfare, um, travel cards, and commercial services like banking, transportation, micropayments. Um, if you think about what's going on in India with their UID project that, that um, Peter mentioned, there, this whole project is conceived as a platform for a host of commercial and, and government services. It is not simply an identity infrastructure in the abstract. The, the, the way that this system is being architected, the way they're talking about rolling it out, it's integrally, integrally, integrally linking um, commerce and e-government, or commerce and government services. Um, Germany's new national ID is being revisioned as a multi-service card. And um, now I've actually um, had some feedback that, that even though they're claiming that their ICAO and EC travel card standard, um, that they're meeting those standards, that that is not necessarily the case. There's a debate, you know, maybe there's a debate about that. Maybe, you know, there's promotion that's going on or there's some um, back and forth between um, Germany and the standards body. R regardless of the actual state of those standards, the notion that, that, that countries are building IDs that are envisioned to meet a number of um, standards for different applications is critically important. And then, as Peter mentioned, um, what's going on in the NFC world. I mean, here in the United States, the ISIS program, um, the handset manufacturers, the mobile operators, the financial institutions are, are collaborating on NFC. They have realized, unless there are universal standards, that you cannot build a, an e-commerce infrastructure. And so when you think about these things going on, the, the infrastructure that's being developed from the government side, the infrastructure that's being developed from the commercial side, you start to begin to understand how important um, these, these, these applications are and the credentials that are going to allow these applications um, to prol proliferate across the globe, really. And what's been interesting about the NFC is every time they've done an NFC test worldwide, when they've allowed people to use their um, mobile phones to perform transactions, from buying things from vending machines to transportation cards to physical access, integrating physical access with, with other types of app financial applications, um, people basically don't want to give the phones up. Every, every single test has been um, incredibly successful, which is highly unusual with innovative technology. So the commercial market, what's interesting to me is this, um, the notion, you know, and this is kind of, you know, I'm, I'm spewing Apple's uh, 
marketing jargon, which is the iPhone changes everything. Well, the iPhone does change everything in a lot of ways. I mean, I, was, I had a mobile phone for years. I never used it for anything but calling people. And then I saw, actually, I was on the way to London um, to the biometrics conference, and I saw an iPhone that someone had, and I just said I had to have one. And the truth of the matter is I didn't even know I needed an iPhone until I had the iPhone, and now I use my iPhone for everything. And it, it is truly amazing when you build a device um, that, that changes the way you interact with technology that it allow, gives you access to the technology. My previous phones had a lot of the same capabilities. I had calendars. I had contact lists. I had a lot of things that I never used simply because it was too difficult for me to use it. And when I got my iPhone, I, my daughter was two and a half, and it took her about two weeks to figure out how to get to the pictures because I had all my pictures of her loaded on it, and she liked to look at them. You know, and if a two-and-a-half-year-old can figure it out in a short period of time, then I think it says a lot. Um, across the board, devices are getting faster, smaller, cheaper, smarter. Um, what's interesting is that you, you can now embed a sensor in the device, and um, that sensor can become an on and off, a, a fingerprint sensor essentially becomes an on and off switch or a pointer device. So you've got biometrics that are built into these, techno into these um, handsets now as mobile devices that, that are not adding any cost. I mean, initially people said, well, who's going to pay for the cost of adding a sensor to a phone? Well, you don't have to because actually the, the, the pointing device, the, 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 the biometric integrated pointing device, Authentic makes this, costs less than the pointing device that used to previous, previously exist on the phone. So you basically have no cost biometric um, access to the handset integrated at no cost. As I said, NFC is coming full throttle. Um, we're talking about building, you know, having an infrastructure built and having all the headset manufacturers getting together and saying, you know, we're gonna, we have to have a single standard or this is not going to work. Um, you have dual facing cameras, you, you know, payment processes being integrated into, the, into these devices. And, and when I say iPhone now, basically what I mean is the iPhone and, and iPhone-like devices, whether it's the Android or whatever other versions of this we're going to see. But to me, this is the new standard for how we're going to interact with a mobile device. Um, what's interesting, too, is there's something on the order of um, 5 billion phones for um, 6.9 billion people on the planet. Um, in countries like Russia, Italy, and in Hong Kong, and in Montenegro, there are actually more phones than there are people. If you look at these numbers, I thought that was pretty astounding. Um, and what this does, bringing biometrics into this environment, is it basically really expands the biometric foot footprint. And I think in the long run, when you have consumers that are, that are going to have these devices that are biometrics are integrated into, and you have so many of these out in the field, and the more and more personal and private and important critical information, both as consumers and as employees that we're storing on these devices, um, biometrics become absolutely critical. And the notion that when you have all these devices in the field that are biometrically enabled, that you have a, a, a um, access in your home or access in your enterprise that is not biometric or biometrically secure doesn't make sense. And so I think that proliferation out in the field will end up driving it back into um, both the home uh, uh, consumer use and enterprise use. The government market, um, what's interesting too is, you know, there have been statements made in um, from uh, from within the military that they think that everybody in the field ought to have an iPhone, that there's all these applications that can be driven out to the field to use them. Now, clearly, there are issues um, with, secure, with, with securing these devices, with ruggedization, with, you know, access because um, people are using, you know, have, have equipment on or have their hands covered, whatever. But at the end of the day, I mean, the, the military recognizes how useful this device is. And so they're actually talking about, you know, how do we get them into the field? And what I always say is that, you know, if, um, if the government had asked Apple or any other company to develop an iPhone, it would have been a 60-pound device that, you know, was like the size of your backpack. Um, there, there's no way that you can develop for the government, um, for a government, to, to government specification, the kind of product that emerges in the commercial market. And, you know, obviously there's been a number of very successful mobile devices that are being, being used out in the military today. Um, it's been expanding the footprint again. And, and again, this drives biometrics closer to the center into, um, you know, when you talk about, you know, military or government enterprise adoption. But I do think it's also important to realize that, you know, that 
when you, it, it's much easier and in certain ways it makes a lot more sense to take a device that's been developed for commercial use and adapt it for government use. It's also much, a much more viable business model for vendors in the industry because what we've seen over the years is, is all kinds of vendors following potential government contracts, whether they're military or civil, um, to build very specific types of equipment that really are single purpose and, and, and often onerous because of the specifications associated with it. And it's also often not a profitable enterprise for a company to do this. If you happen to win the contract at the end of years of, of you know, building prototypes and going through this process, you know, maybe it's one big bang and you can build a successful business off of that. But it's a much more viable business model to actually build for commercial use um, something that maybe 60 to 80 percent of what the government needs and then have the government say, wow, that's really great. We need that, but can you do X, Y, and Z? And you have a viable business and you say, oh yeah, we can, we can actually customize that for you and it's going to cost you X number of dollars, as opposed to trying to continually develop to government standards that change and evolve and, and may never actually turn into, into a product. But we have certainly have seen biometrics being used very effectively in the field um, for different types of government applications, whether it's the border or the military, um, you know, law enforcement. So both of these things to me come together when you start talking about the commercial side and the, and the government side, which essentially is that the field-based biometrics end up driving this into the enterprise. And when you have basically a vast number of citizens and or um, military government personnel um, using devices that have contain critical proprietary high security data and communications, you have to secure those devices. And again, when, when you start building that security out in the field, then it certainly makes sense to build it um, in home base as well. And, and, you know, we're talking about this technology now, you know, people, a couple years ago I was talking to a company that was doing um, keyboard, keystroke recognition. And, and their big issue was, wow, you know, you can continuously monitor somebody through keystroke recognition. And when I got my new computer, which is a Mac, after 20 years of being, you know, on PCs, and they, they had this beautiful high-res camera built into the um, screen. I said, well, why, why, if I'm going to do continuous monitoring, why don't I grab my face or my iris every few frames? And people are like, oh, you can't do it. It's too expensive. You know, you have to deal with infrared. I got off the phone this morning with a company that actually has solved that problem and has basically been looking at facial recognition for years and solved the, the lighting issues. I mean, they can, they can essentially generate their own light and, and deal with it in any condition. So when you're talking about the kind of continuous monitoring that you'd like to have, whether it's on your iPhone or whether it's on your computer, when you're accessing critical information or your own personal information that you want secured, um, that's a reality. I mean, the capabilities to do that with biometrics, and we're not just talking about, you know, fingerprints on the device, which is one way to do it. We're talking about potentially face and iris, um, you know, especially when you have dual facing cameras. It's, it's kind of a no-brainer to think about doing that. And people always say, oh, I'm way ahead of the technology. But again, we're talking about the future here, you know, and I have a lot of faith in and technologists. I think there are people that spend a lot of time sitting around in rooms trying to figure out how to solve these technical problems. And I've been around the industry long enough, you know, both biometrics and, and prior to that, um, particularly in the 3D graphics arena, to know that these problems do get solved. So the many faces of mobility, this is interesting to me because I really believe that 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 there will we we, are, we, we will use our biometrics directly to interact with certain devices for, for certain time types of trans trans um, transactions or access. But I also think that this, that our mobile devices are going to become personal authentication devices and that not only are we going to be authenticating um, to the device so that we get access to the device, we will be authenticating transactions, both information transactions and financial transactions, so that for some transactions where there's a low risk, you may simply authenticate to your device and your device says, yes, the, the right person is holding this device and therefore we can do transaction X, Y, and Z. We may also use these for much more complex transactions where you actually have to um, capture biometrics on these devices and send templates and verify against central, centralized um, databases. And again, this is within the context of a risk management model. Um, I also believe that, that eventually um, your um, IDs will, will be built into this device, whether it's a national ID, whether it's a, a travel document, passport, visa. Um, uh, 
financial services and whether there's how this is managed in terms of whether there's multiple chips that do multiple things, if they build firewalls. I mean, you know, I believe that those are certainly technical challenges. I believe those technical challenges can be addressed. I think the policy issues are probably much greater than that, but I also think that there is such a drive towards doing this because it really makes sense that that's, that's what's going to happen. I and mean, we already have our boarding passes in our phones. Um, it is a stretch to go from that to having your passport in there, but really if the, at the end of the day what your passport is is the chip in your passport, then really what form factor that chip sits in um, can be flexible. And I think eventually will will be embedded in our mobile devices and, and, and we're not going to have fobs and we're not going to have a million cards, we're going to have our smart personal authentication device. So implications for this. Mobility creates bottom-up evolution. It goes from the, from the field, it goes from the consumer's hands and their daily transactions into um, the enterprise, into the home, into the you know, central military operations. Um, biometrics is enabling technology, so you have to enable something. I've had this conversation for, for a long time in this industry, which is nobody cares about the biometrics. What they care about is what, what biometrics allows you to do. And what it allows you to do is to create secure platforms and transactions. It allows you to facilitate a higher level of security. It allows you to create convenience for people um, that don't have to walk around with cards or memorized pins or all the rest of that, that nonsense. And I think you really, to be successful in the industry, um, to think about moving the industry forward, that, that this focus is important, and, and you uh, again going back to what Peter said. You know, you, you're looking at the phone companies now. You're looking at the handset operators. They are committed to building, to have universal standards, and to building um, transaction platforms. And and so, as an industry, we need to engage in that process and and not assume it's someone else's problem to solve. Because if the biometrics aren't built in from the beginning, it's going to be really hard to add them on later. Um, you have to innovate and standardize. You have to think about, you know where the market is going and you have to be willing to operate within a, a uh, defined set of parameters that allow you to interoperate with everybody else. Um, and this is interesting too, and this goes back to this whole notion of, you know, if the government asked Apple to build an iPhone or anybody else to build an iPhone that they would have gotten the 60 pound backpack. At the end of the day, I think this is true, not just in biometrics, but in all emerging technologies. And I know this is counterintuitive, and I know most people like to run around after government contracts, but at the end of the day, if you can build a viable commercial solution that solves a problem, a business-breaking problem, your adoption likelihood is very high if you can actually show you know, a clear ROI in a commercial environment. Um, once you've done that, and the government says, wow, that stuff's great, it's much easier, as I said, and much, a much more viable option to then customize for the government um, so you can leverage their infrastructure and customize these technologies to make them work. And I, you know, this is something that I've been talking about for a long time, but I think it's going to continue to be important as we look to the future of, uh, of biometrics. Come on, there we go. Thank you. Okay, there we go. So, Again, um, I, I want you to remember that what I'm talking about is not what's going to happen in the next 18 months. This is an ongoing process. I want to invite you to come and uh, visit the QD website. We just put up a new website. It's, it's great. We, we also have started a blog, and, and I'm Twittering. Um, I'm somewhat late to the social networking scene, but um, we invite you to join us. And uh, as I say, it's our, it's our uh, immediate gratification opportunity for those of you who don't want to wait for our research reports and uh, presentations like this. So thanks again, and I'll uh, hand it back to Peter. Well, thank you very much, Max. I really appreciate your, your comments. And uh, we've had a number of uh, very interesting questions come in, which we will deal with in just one second. But first of all, I'd like to share with you the results of the, the poll that we, we had. And um, very interesting. Uh, the majority thought that uh, in five years' time, uh, only less than 25% would be biometrically enrolled. Uh, but there's a fairly significant grouping in the 25 to 75%. Very few of you thought that this would be 
happening in the more than 75 percent. Now interestingly when we asked this question at the NDIA conference the majority of uh, responses just by a show of hands mind you were in the 50 to 75 percent range so um, I think what you're starting to see here is that uh, definitely the industry is growing and uh, my personal opinion is that it will be in the 50 to 75 percent range and uh, Max do you have a feeling on that one? Well see I look at those numbers a little bit differently and one of the things I appreciate so much about Peter is his data. Peter has great data that he's been tracking in the industry but see I look at this and I say oh 39 percent of the respondents think more than 50 percent will be enrolled. So that's how I look at this data, and I think that's, you know, to me, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in the 50% range myself, at least that much, you know. And it also depends on what your, your definition of biometrically enrolled, um, you know, some, if you're talking about just biometrics for your own personal devices, then maybe I think it goes a little bit higher than that. But we know that we're going to have 130 million people with annually being issued um, biometric passport. So that's some level of biometric enrollment right there. Great. And uh, now I'd like to move into the questions. We've received a number of questions and I'll just remind you if you have a question, please just type it into the right hand side of your your um, uh, control panel and we'll be uh, doing our best to uh, answer that. Um, so the first question that we had uh, in, in our opinion, did the concern with standards decrease over time due to the fact that adequate standards were developed or that standards were deemed less important. Um, maybe I'll start off with this, Max, and then you can jump in. I, I, do th I do not think that standards have become less important. I do think that tremendous work was done um, uh, from when I started in the industry in about 2001 uh, up until the, the present time, but <clears throat> during 2004 to 6, 7 in there, uh, there were great strides made uh, with standards and interoperability, but uh, I would suggest that as our last webinar that was hosted by John Mears suggested, there still is a lot of work to be done in that regard, especially as more and more uh, biometric information is, is desired to be shared across countries. Uh, and so I think there still is a lot of work to be done, but I, I don't think the importance of standards in interoperability has decreased at all. Max, do you have a thought on that one? Yeah, I would say that, that we were in a standards crisis some years back because there really weren't any. And um, I don't think it's less important. I just think that some standards have been developed. There's work going on in that area. I think probably what that's reflecting is some confidence um, that the folks in the biometrics community have that, that we are addressing them. Great. And now the next question, what can biometric software companies do for the industry to help combat the public's fear about privacy? Uh, so what can software companies do for the biometric industry to help combat the public's fear of privacy violations by using biometrics. Um, Max, I'm going to throw this one over to you. Okay, I, I would say the, the first thing that, that any company can do is actually engage with the privacy advocates. And I know people don't like to do this, um, but I, I, I'd say invite those people in and, and ask them because that, they spend their lives doing that. And there is a range, there are a range of people in this um, category. I remember years ago when I was producing a, the Biometrics Market Intelligent published a printed newsletter, I did a, a, a piece on this. And, and really what I found was there are some privacy agencies that don't want anything to do with it, but there are others that are, will actually engage. So I would say that's one thing that you can do. Um, I would say the other thing to do is to um, develop your own privacy policies and um, commit to preserving privacy and it's embedding that technology in your software in whatever way possible. Again, you know, I'm not an expert in that area, but I, there are things that you can do. And I also think it has to do with promoting biometrics, and this goes back to the education piece, as a privacy han enhancing technology. In other words, if we can use biometrics to give people control over their own personal information, then that actually is an improvement over what's happening today. 
Great. And the next question we have is, um, what are your thoughts on the necessity for multimodal biometric applications in the consumer or government space? Can single biometrics be enough? I'll start with this one, Max. Um, it really depends on the uh, application that's required. In some applications, single biometrics will do quite nicely. Uh, in others, multimodal is definitely the way to go. So I think really the first step there is to take a look at what the requirement is and then move forward from there. And that would also hold true for what type of biometric you choose to deploy, whether it be face or iris or, or vascular pattern. Um, it really depends on the need of the particular application. Max, do you have a further thought on that one? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, when I think about biometrics um, on the consumer side, for example, you know, to me, as I talked about, when you, when you look at mobile biometrics, the use of biometrics in mobility, there's different levels of risk associated with different types of transactions. And my guess is that based on the level of risk, you might have one or more biometrics. Um, you know, you could use, you might want to use a physical biometric um, you know, like a touch face biometric, like a fingerprint, to actually give you access to, to, to a device. You might want to capture an iris or a face to do some other types of transactions. So I think there's a natural um, kind of synergy between these things. And I, I mean, as you see in the government applications, I mean, they're sending these, bi these multimodal biometric um, devices out into the field, capturing, you know, a, a number of biometrics. And I think that's, that's um, going to be part of the way these applications evolve. And I think part of it is getting better and understanding, you know, do, are you just using multiple biometrics individually? Are you fusing them? How are you doing that? You know, what fusion really means and how successful we are at learning how to do that um, to increase the likelihood that we are um, correctly identifying someone and to reduce the risk associated with a specific transaction. Thanks, Max. Um, we're going we're gonna to try and handle two or three more questions. Um, uh, we have a significant number here, and we'll try and, and also respond uh, after the webinar with, with some, some comments. Um, and the next question, in 2014, what percent of necessary infrastructure to read e-passports will be deployed and operable? Now, Max, I know you've done a, a lot of work and have a, a tremendous report out in this particular area. Can you give some insight into that particular question? Okay, so I, I, I'm wondering, I, I guess I'm wondering a little bit more about that question. When you talk about reading e-passports, are we talking about um, simply reading the data off the chip, or are we talking about actually doing a biometric authentication? Um, you know, I, I, I think it's hard to give a number. What I will say is this. Um, I think what we're going to see in the 214 plus time frame is a shift from using automated border control, you know, what we like to call as e-gates, um, from sort of pilot and, and small scale projects to a significant amount of the traffic that's moving across borders. We're going to begin to see that those e-gates proliferate in the 2014 to 2020 timeframe. Um, and so I think it's going to, going to become much more commonplace, and that means you need, not only do you need a document reader in an e-gate, but you need to have the capability to do a biometric match as well. Um, what, what The other thing I think that's critically important that's going to happen when that does happen is what we're going to find out is that we have some issues with the way that we're currently collecting biometrics and using them in passports. Most today, most passports have a facial recognition, you know, have, have an image of a face, digi digital image of a face embedded in the chip. Now, these, the vast majority of these images are basically being captured by photographs, and these photographs are then being digitized. And I think what happens is once we go to an automated system, we start to see that that level of en biometric enrollment is not adequate. So um, we're going to have the beginning of a rollout. We're going to have some glitches in that rollout because we're going to find a lot of these uh, passports aren't adequate because the, the actual, we need live capture enrollment, not the sort of you know, photographic conversion type of enrollment we've had. So we'll have a hiccup. We'll have a little bit of a stall. We'll begin to upgrade um, 
the, the, the document um, enrollment process, and then we're going to really see this, this whole eGate infrastructure take off. And, um, you know, it, there's been some great studies. In fact, uh, uh, Cyril Battelle of, of um, Accenture gave a presentation in, um, I believe, last year at the Biometrics Conference in London where he talked about some of the, the, the actual data they had on throughput and how they were measuring that. And so basically when you start looking at you know, growth of passenger travel through particular airports and you look at the uptake of biometric passports, um, you'll begin to really be able to analyze specifically in specific locations you know, how many of these e-gates are going to be deployed um, and then you know, subsequently how many mobile readers you need on the desk for people that may or may not have problems passing through them. So I know I didn't actually specifically give you a number, whoever wanted that number, but um, at least I'm trying to provide some context for understanding how those numbers are going to be determined. Max, thank you very much for that answer. We're going to take one more question, uh, but before we do, I just want to remind everybody that uh, this presentation and this webinar will be available online, both at uh, Fine Biometrics and at Acuity. So, uh, and we'll be sending emails out to everybody to let them know the links to get through to that. And the final question we have uh, has to do with the financial industry. And the question is, why is the banking industry not progressing well in adopting biometrics, especially in retail banking transactions? And I'll start off with this one, Max. Um, it's interesting to see around the, the world that, uh, indeed, some financial uh, uh, institutions have adopted biometrics quite readily. It really depends where you are globally. Uh, but I think this question probably relates more to the North American experience where, uh, certain industries are slow in adopting certain technologies, uh, but I think with the information that we presented today with regard to the almost the race to try and secure mobile financial transactions, I think you're going to see that this whole area heats up quite uh, actively over the next few years, and I think the, uh, the retail sector will be playing along uh, right in line with, this, uh, with, this, with these developments. Max, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, no, I, I think you're right on, Peter. And I would just say that, again, this goes to this notion that, it, that the mobility is going to drive the central office, that they'll, this will ha be happening on mobile devices, and then people will go up to their ATMs and go into their banks and say, well, how come you're not biometrically authenticating me? And so it'll, be, it'll end up being driven from the outside in. Great. Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of our... Uh, attendees, again, there were over 200 uh, of your colleagues participating in today's webinar, and we want to thank you very much for your time, and we will be sending out links uh, so you, that, that you can access the, uh, the presentation materials online. Thank you very much from findbiometrics.com and Acuity Marketing Intelligence, and also I would remind you to visit the IBIA's website at ibia.org to learn more about how to get involved in the industry. Thank you very much. I'm signing off now. Goodbye.